Welcome to the May 2018 World War II History Roundtable, the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch World War II Roundtable, in our uh, 31st year. This is the last program of our 31st year. And I also want to recognize the World War II veterans. Would the World War II veterans in the audience stand up? I know we got one right here, right here. Back from Arizona. Good to see you, Paul. Thank you for coming this evening. And um, y y since, the, since this program is, is kind of focused at winning the victory, uh, how many in the audience, if you would stand up or, or raise your hand, were living in citizens of Europe that, that were in Europe in the post-war period. We got some here in the front. Hey, got, great, great. Mark has taken over the organization of this program and added some youth and extra vitality. Marshall. George Marshall, a chief of staff of the Army during World War II, uh, redesigned the General Officer Corps for uh, U.S. combat divisions, corps, armies, fielding some of the best commanders, best of the best, implementing a strategy for victory. This guy is, I, I, and then what, I mean, the Marshall Plan is actually when he's Secretary of State. He takes it to the next level. It's interagency, gold level, uh, platinum diplomacy, uh, new international organizations. This is going to be a great program. Ben Steele. Well, he's an American economist and writer. Uh, he wrote, uh, wrote the, his previous work was the Battle of Brenton Woods. He was educated uh, in his, uh, uh, at the Wharton School, and I think a couple of people have heard of the Wharton School. We understand it's the greatest. And um, also at Oxford for his master's and his PhD. Um, and uh, he's no slouch. He's also senior fellow and director of international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's the founder and editor of International Finance. He's been awarded the Hayek Prize in the Spear Book Award, uh, and he is our tonight's feature presentation, The Marshall Plan, Dawn of the Cold War. Let's give him a warm welcome, Ben Steele. It's really an honor to be here tonight. I can't tell you how gratifying it is uh, to see so many people come out on a Thursday night for a history lecture, so thank you all um, very, very much. Um, 2018 marks the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, and perhaps its most enduring legacy has been the endless desire to repeat it. In the past five years alone, there have been impassioned calls for new Marshall Plans in Ukraine, in Greece, in Southern Europe, in North Africa, in Gaza, and most recently in Syria, but the old original one has never been replicated or even badly imitated. And I think that speaks to the unique historical circumstances in place at the time the Marshall Plan was launched. In 1947, the United States dominated the globe economically and militarily like never before and never since. We accounted for about half the world's manufacturing output, and of course, we had sole possession of atomic weapons. Uh, we could have, had we chosen at the time, pursued a policy of, let's say, America first. But we had memories of what we did after World War I when we went home and disengaged from the world and how that led to um, a, a second world war and we were determined not to get ourselves into a third. Um, so instead, uh, the United States dedicated enormous sums uh, to, for example, relief aid in Europe, even in the two-year run-up to the Marshall Plan. So it's, it's not as if the Marshall Plan was unique uh, in terms of the size of the aid. It was very uh, unique in terms of the focus of the aid. Um, it was a unilateral. We took the power to direct the aid away from uh, UNRWA, a new uh, UN uh, organization, and we directed it ourselves, and I must say we did a much better job of it. Uh, we also created a host of new multilateral uh, institutions in order to promote international cooperation. It's rather remarkable to realize today that all of the institutions that we associate with the post-war liberal order were created by the United States in just a few short years after World War II. 
the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, and the predecessor organizations to the European Union and the World Trade Organization were all created by the United States between 1945 and 1949. And importantly for my story, two of these institutions, the European Union and NATO, would not exist were it not for the Marshall Plan. Now that might sound surprising, uh, but this grand project of integrating uh, Western Europe economically, politically, and later militarily was actually the first major component of the new American geostrategy fathered by the great um, uh, American diplomat George Kennan of containing the Soviet Union. And to understand how that came about, we have to go back a few years further to the war years. During the Second World War, of course, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies in the fight against Nazi Germany. But as um, Soviet uh, dictator Joseph Stalin wryly observed at the 1943 Tehran Allied War Leaders Conference, quote unquote, the best friendships are founded on misunderstandings. <laughs> and indeed, the misunderstandings between FDR and Stalin were truly profound. Uh, FDR believed or wanted desperately to believe that after the war, the Soviets would effectively contain themselves. That is, that they would be satisfied with their newly expanded uh, borders, um, with the new security buffer that uh, Stalin had built for himself um, in Eastern Europe. And Stalin, for his part, believed that after the war, the Americans would go home, just like they had after World War I. And tragically, this misunderstanding unraveled almost immediately after the end of the fighting in May of 1945. Uh, in 1946, uh, Stalin begins pressing territorial claims in Turkey and northern Iran. He refuses to withdraw Soviet troops from northern Iran. These are uh, troops that had been stationed in Iran under treaty during the war, and he only backs down after President Truman sends a military flotilla to the region. But the true watershed moment comes in February of 1947 when Britain, which is near bankrupt now, its empire is imploding, uh, comes to the State Department and announces that they are immediately going to begin withdrawing all of their 40,000 troops from Greece where they are protecting the Greek government against Yugoslav-backed communist insurgents. Greece is in the midst of a terrible civil war at the time. And this really sets off alarm bells within the State Department because they come to the conclusion that if the United States does not somehow fill the vacuum being left by Britain's imperial implosion, Stalin is going to do it. Uh, at this point, however, Stalin had already begun shifting his um, focus away from the Mediterranean and towards his priority, which was Central Europe and in one country in particular, not surprisingly, Germany. Uh, after the war, Germany was divided into four zones of occupation. In the west, of course, the uh, uh, American, British, and French zones. In the east, the Soviet zone. And Berlin, which was uh, located in the Soviet zone, is a mirror image of this, divided into four sectors. Um, now, General Marshall, who's been in the post of Secretary of State uh, for all of six weeks, um, in the early March, flies off to Moscow for his most important uh, diplomatic uh, mission. He is going to be negotiating with his Soviet counterpart, who you see in the, the middle, second from the uh, right, Vyacheslav Molotov, to try to reach a peace treaty um, uh, over uh, Germany, um, to reunify the country, and to begin um, um, to end uh, the occupation. He is uh, accompanied by the British foreign minister on the uh, left, um, uh, Ernest Bevan, the French foreign minister on the right, uh, Georges Bidot. But of course, they have their, their own specific um, security interests when it comes to um, uh, Germany. Um, 
Now, as I said, there were six grueling weeks of nego negotiations between Marshall and uh, Molotov. And in the end, uh, Stalin gets involved, too, negotiating one-on-one -on -one with uh, Mar Marshall. And they reach no agreement uh, whatsoever on Germany. There's one narrow issue that divides them, and that's the issue of reparations. The Soviet Union is demanding uh, $10 billion in reparations from Western Germany. This is about $110 billion in today's money. Um, Western Germany at the time is really sinking into chaos and disorder. Parts of it are in near starvation. And Marshall makes clear that these reparations are impossible at this point. Uh, because Western Germany is entirely dependent on the United States. And this would effectively be the United States paying reparations to the Soviet Union. We had done something similar after World War I, and we weren't going to repeat the experience. But there was actually a, a deeper, far more fundamental issue that divided the two. And the, we never would have reached agreement on this. Neither the United States nor the Soviet Union could afford to have a unified Germany as an ally of the other. Germany was that important and that potentially uh, threatening. So in uh, mid-April of 1947, after a final meeting with uh, Stalin, Marshall goes home convinced not just that Stalin's being a tough negotiator, but that he's actually happy to see Western Germany sink into chaos and disorder and to drag down all of Western Europe with it. Uh, why? He doesn't need tanks to take over Western Europe. He has communist fifth columns in Italy and France. The local communist parties are extremely uh, powerful. Marshall realizes what the game is. He comes home, immediately makes an important radio address um, uh, to the nation in which he uh, tells the American people, quote unquote, the patient is sinking while the doctors deliberate. This was his way of saying that the United States was now going to abandon the so-called Yalta Potsdam framework for cooperation with the Soviets. We were going to have to pursue our vital economic and security interest in Europe unilaterally on our own. So it's at this point that the United States decides cooperation with the Soviets is over. I subtitled my book Dawn of the Cold War, and I expected that to be uh, somewhat controversial with most Cold War historians who dated the Cold War to 1945. But the reason I say the Marshall Plan was the dawn of the Cold War is it's not until Marshall introduces the, the ideas that became the Marshall Plan that Stalin writes off any prospect for cooperation. In fact, in May of 1947, I discovered in the Russian archives that Stalin actually directed a Soviet negotiating delegation to reach agreement with the United States on the creation of an interim unified government in Korea. Um, now, uh, why is, uh, has Stalin reached some sort of uh, grand kumbaya moment? No. Uh, but he's willing to make compromises with the Americans in order to wait them out, because he sees that Truman is withdrawing the, the, the troops. And once the Americans leave Germany, he'll be able to, to take over the um, uh, real prize. Now, while Marshall is um, uh, in Moscow for these negotiations. President Truman delivers his famous Truman Doctrine speech. Um, and this is uh, quite harsh in tone. In fact, Marshall and Kennan thought it was um, uh, too harsh in tone. But President Truman actually introduces some central ideas in his speech that really become the foundation of what would, what would become the Marshall Plan. Um, he pledges to assist countries facing, quote unquote, aggressive movements that seek to impose upon them totalitarian regimes. Of course, he's referring to the Soviet Union, even though he doesn't name them. But very importantly, he emphasizes that, that it is not military aid, but economic and financial aid that is, quote unquote, most essential to economic stabilization and orderly political processes. Now, why is this? Again, go back to the end of the fighting in May of 1945. There are over 3 million American troops in Europe. 
Now, President Truman has been president for all of a few weeks. He's an accidental president. He has no intention of overthrowing the uh, foreign pol policy architecture that FDR had put in place. And FDR had actually pledged in Tehran in 1943 to withdraw all American troops from Europe within two years of the end of the fighting. And President Truman goes forward with that. Fast forward to um, 1946, Stalin is showing that um, uh, he's acquisitive and uh, aggressive, and the American military establishment now has a big problem because the troops are already on their way home. How do we defend our vital economic and security interest in Europe without the military? And so it's fascinating to realize that the fundamental ideas that led to the Marshall Plan came not from economists, even though we all know that, generally speaking, the best policy ideas come from economists, but they came from the, the military establishment. These were people like Secretary of War Henry Stimson, Army Secretary Kenneth Royal, uh, Navy Secretary, later Defense Secretary Jim Forrestal, who was a hawk's hawk. Um, this, was, this was no lover of, of, uh, of foreign aid, but even um, Forrestal argued before Congress that the, this massive martial aid was, quote unquote, far less expensive than standing isolated and alone in an unfriendly world. So the idea was that we could leverage our economic dominance in the world to counter the Soviet conventional force superiority in Europe. It was, as it were, a form of asymmetric warfare. And the underlying philosophy behind what became the Marshall Plan is extremely important. I can't emphasize this enough. And that was that America's own economic and physical security depended on it having strong, independent, democratic, capitalist allies abroad. Not colonies, not vassals, not tributaries, not transactional counterparts, but allies who would stick with us over generations. For example, Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, in defending the Marshall Plan, said that the recovery of Western Europe is a 25 to 50 year project. That was the time frame they were thinking of at the time. And then he said, and the money that we dedicate today and over the next three years will, in the long future, result in our having strong friends abroad. So we wanted to create this alliance of nations first in Europe, and then we would take this strategy to the Asia Pacific, countries that would align their foreign policy with ours, stick with us through thick and thin, because we shared common values, important common values. So who were the main architects of what became the Marshall Plan? First, uh, George Kennan, uh, second from the right. He is really the um, creator of the geostrategy behind the Marshall Plan. As I mentioned, this is the face first major component of his new overarching strategy of containing the uh, Soviet Union. A man who's tragically not remembered very much today. I just came from Houston and Dallas, though, and they remember him. Uh, on the right, Will Clayton, a, a, a good Houstonian. Um, Will Clayton is the Under Secretary for Economic Affairs, and he, in many ways, can cons be considered to be the father of the European Union. Um, he was the one who made the integration of Western Europe the central pillar behind the Marshall Plan. And in fact, he had to drag the French into this idea, uh, kicking and screaming. The French were in no mood uh, to embrace the Germans at the time. This was very much the State Department um, that drove home the message that Western Europe needed to be integrated. On the right, who is that, Axel? <laughs> General Lucius Clay. The military gov American military governor in um, uh, Germany. He is not part of the State Department, certainly not formally associated with the Marshall Plan, but General Clay deserves, in my view, enormous credit 
for reversing disastrous American occupation policy um, uh, in Germany, which was based on the so-called 1944 Morgenthau Plan uh, to dismember and deindustrialize Germany. By the time we get to 1947, this is turning into a humanitarian, moral, and geostrategic disaster. And I think Lucius Clay deserves more credit than anyone for reversing um, uh, this policy and making Germany uh, the re revitalization of, of Germany into one of the uh, great pillars of the Marshall Plan. Uh, on the right, sen Republican Senator Arthur Vandenberg, one-time isolationist. Um, he is chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, uh, we're, we're, we have a, a divided government at the time. Uh, um, a, a democratic president, an accidental president, really not respected in Congress, a Republican Congress. The Marshall Aid legislation could never have gone through without Senator Vandenberg playing this um, uh, vital bridge role. So he deserves um, e enormous credit. Of course, on the left, uh, General Marshall, not so much an architect of the plan in terms of producing the micro details behind it, but a master synthesizer and the best possible uh, salesman. After Marshall introduces the ideas that become the Marshall Plan in June, um, uh, President Truman's primary political advisor, Clark Clifford, suggests to him that we should call this the Truman Plan. And Truman, being a very wise politician, laughs and says, don't even think of it. He said, anything going before Congress bearing my name will, quote unquote, twitch a few times, go belly up, and die. <laughs> he said, but even the worst Republican could not vote against the plan named for the general. Um, and I think he was right. It's very difficult to imagine anybody else in the United States as Secretary of State in a Democratic administration who could have pushed through a massive foreign aid package through a Republican Congress that wanted its peace dividend. Um, and that had rightly been convinced that the aid money that America had been dedicating over the past two years was, was not um, uh, uh, successful. Um, so, in June of uh, 1947, um, Marshall gives a, a speech at uh, Harvard. It's, of course, an iconic one, very famous today. But uh, Marshall was not a great orator. And in fact, he wasn't looking uh, for splashy headlines in the newspapers. He, uh, Dean Acheson, for example, who uh, was his uh, uh, deputy, tried to convince him that Harvard was a bad place to introduce these big ideas. It's not high profile enough. We want to make sure everybody pays attention. And Marshall said, no, 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 I want the ideas to Germany. Uh, Acheson was so concerned about this that before Marshall's speech, he called in a group of British newsmen and said, Marshall's going to make an incredibly important speech. You may not realize how important it is. He said, but whatever time of night it is, he said, quote unquote, wake up Ernie. That is Sir Ernest Bevan, the British uh, Foreign Secretary, to make sure he knows that he's got to gra grasp the mantle. Um, so Marshall's speech is quite short. It's about 1,400 words. And it's quite vague. And this is deliberate. He doesn't produce the details behind the Marshall Plan. Two reasons for this. First, Marshall's a very wise man. And he realizes that this plan is never going to succeed unless the Europeans take ownership of it. It can't be something that the Americans impose on the Europeans. It has to be the Europeans working in concert, coming together, presenting the United States with a unified uh, proposal. His only condition was that Europe had to do it together. That is, they couldn't present the United States with a separate national shopping list. They had to do it together, and they had to decide how to use American resources most efficiently. But the second uh, reason is that um, Marshall did not want to be responsible for erecting the Iron Curtain um, in Europe. He didn't want to exclude any countries from the Marshall Plan. But of course, he was very concerned about the possibility that the Soviets might accept um, uh, this invitation. So George Cannon and uh, Chip Boland, another Soviet 
in the State Department um, told him, uh, don't worry, uh, we've got that all planned out. If Stalin shows interest in uh, joining, we'll keep changing the terms. If, if he keeps showing deep and abiding interest in cooperation with us, finally we will tell him, that's wonderful. We need another creditor to help us bail out Europe. At that point, they were certain that Stalin would walk away. So Marshall wants Stalin to be the one who is responsible for, for splitting Europe by rejecting transparent American magnanimity. Um, now, how does Stalin react to this speech? He's, a, he's somewhat torn. Um, as a matter of economics, he's a Marxist ideologue. He believes that we've reached the final crisis stage of capitalism uh, and that the United States, in calculation of its own self-interest, was going to have to give Europe billions of dollars to bail out its own industry. And he was more than happy to take a few billion of that if it came with no geopolitical strings attached. But he had three important reasons to resist. One is that, as I mentioned before, he had previously believed, particularly because President Truman said it was so, that the Americans were going to go home. And now this, this, this um, uh, new Marshall Plan being talked about made clear that the United States was going to maintain a firm a political and economic, and he believed, rightly, military presence um, in, in Europe. And of course, he was very much opposed to this. Uh, second, his British spies in Washington and London were informing him that the United States was going to change occupation policy in Germany radically and make a, a, a reindustrialized Western Germany into the new industrial engine of an integrated Western Europe. So this is the mortal enemy, Germany, um, uh, being uh, uh, turned into the, the engine of this new hostile uh, capitalist uh, entity. Stalin considered this a mortal security threat. And finally, Stalin was very worried that his own uh, new satellite countries in Eastern and Central Europe would be tempted by this. And indeed, the checks in the polls uh, showed undue enthusiasm for participating um, in, in the Marshall Plan. Initially, Stalin told them all to go off uh, to Paris to negotiate with the other potential recipient countries, make clear that they wouldn't tolerate the American geopolitical terms, stand up and march out. Uh, but when he came to the conclusion that the Czechs in particular could not be relied on to actually storm out of a Western um, aid conference, he changes position entirely. And this is really when the Cold War begins. The political map of Europe changes entirely. During the war in 1943, um, Europe is really a geographic jumble of alliances. But when we move into the Marshall period, you get the familiar political map of, of Europe, uh, the Iron Curtain, as it were. On the right, the Soviet Union and its um, uh, satellite uh, states. On the uh, uh, left, in the west, the Marshall states. So the Marshall Plan really does radically reconfigure the political map of Europe. Stalin had before Marshall's speech allowed some measure of independence to the um, Eastern and Central European uh, governments. There were coalition governments of sorts in Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and, and um, uh, Hungary. He didn't particularly care what brand of socialism they pursued, provided they maintained their fealty to Moscow on foreign policy. But one, there was one country in particular that was um, uh, really interesting. I just published an article yesterday called Who Lost Czechoslovakia? Mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia was legitimately in play. They had free democratic elections in 1946, and they had a coalition government. Two-thirds of, of the cabinet were small d Democrats. One-third um, uh, were communists. And the Democrats in the coalition refused to take no for an answer from Stalin. Even into the fall of 1947, they were still saying publicly that they hoped to be able to participate in the Marshall Plan. This is too much for Stalin. 
So he begins destroying all the coalition governments in uh, Eastern and Central Europe. In February of 1948, he instigates a communist coup in uh, Czechoslovakia. All the small-D Democrats are kicked out of the government, except one, Jan Masaryk, the foreign minister, remains for a few weeks until he mysteriously falls to his death. Um, but this had a galvanizing effect on the Republicans in Congress, who now realized that if they didn't do something immediately to buttress Americans, America's vital economic and security interest in Europe, Stalin would continue to push um, westward with just this sort of subversive uh, uh, action. Now, critical Italian elections were coming up at the end of April. So President Truman pushed for a, a vote in early April. He did win it overwhelmingly. The martial aid legislation is passed on uh, um, uh, April 3rd. And then Stalin reacts to this. Um, he understands now that um, uh, the next vital threat he's going to face from the United States is um, the transformation of Western Germany into a new independent state. So in the spring of 48, he launches the Berlin blockade. Now, the primary purpose of the blockade was not to force the Americans out of Berlin. It was actually to convince them to stop the creation of a West, West German state. He would have been very happy to succeed also in pushing them out of Berlin. But if, if we had pledged not to go forward with the creation of a West German state, he would have ended the blockade. Of course, the blockade was eventually defeated by a uh, heroic allied American-led uh, airlift, but also by a counter blockade um, that the um, US and its allies in, in, imposed on Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which was extremely um, uh, effective. Stalin ends the blockade in May of 14, 1949 simultaneously with the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. So this is really the ultimate humiliation uh, for Stalin, that, that just as he admits that this strategy was a complete failure, the United States introduces this new West German state. In September of 1949, Konrad Adenauer is elected the first um, chancellor of the Federal Republic. One month later, in October, Stalin creates his own Germany, East Germany, the German Democratic Republic. And at this point, the geographic boundaries of the Cold War in Europe are effectively frozen for 40 years. This is a good time just to step back for a moment, focus on the Marshall Plan, um, uh, what it was, uh, what it did. Um, most people focus on the money. Let's talk a little bit about that. It was $13.2 billion spread over four years. This was 2.6% of recipient country output, 1.1% of US output. To put this in a contemporary perspective, if we were to launch a Marshall Plan today of equivalent size as a percentage of our output, that would be over $800 billion. Um, when you add military assistance above and beyond, we're approaching something like a trillion dollars. And you have to put this against the e economic context in the United States. The US GDP growth rate in 1946 was negative 11.5%. So this is a massive recession brought on by the collapse of government spending after the end of the Second World War. So this was a significant commitment of resources. Uh, what happened during the Marshall years? Well, um, uh, Western European output soared by um, uh, 60%. Um, and so all the early eulogistic accounts of the Marshall Plan simply reflexively ascribed it to the money uh, and said it must have been the Marshall aid and, and that was it. It wasn't until many decades later that uh, skeptical economists, economists began looking at this uh, and running um, uh, econometrics, econometric statistical exercises to try to find the mysterious Keynesian mechanisms, Mark, by which the Marshall Plan succeeded. So Mark's on the edge of his seat now. Fine. Which way will he go? Is he a Keynesian? Is, is he a Hayekian? What is he? OK, so here's the answer. Um, the economists came out, out baffled. They said, well, was it that 
um, the Marshall Plan allowed these countries to import more than they otherwise would have been able to since they were so short on dollars and gold? And the answer is yes, it did, but it wouldn't account for more than a fraction of this enormous recovery in output. Was it that it facilitated more government spending in Europe? Mark, what do you think was the answer? I'm going to ask my economist friends. <laughs> well, he's bailing out. <laughs> I'll answer it later. All right, there you go. The answer is no. Government spending actually fell as a percentage of output in Europe over the Marshall Plan. So what did do it in the end? And I would emphasize two factors that are extremely hard to measure. Kennan, who was not an economist, always argued that the, the money was primarily a social stabilizer to allow the Europeans to pursue these um, uh, structural reforms. But the critical part of the Marshall Plan was going to be psychological to convince the Europeans that the Americans were making a long-term commitment uh, to their security and prosperity. This wasn't going to be like after World War I. Kennan insisted that it had to be a four-year plan. We weren't just going to write a check and go home. We want to show the Europeans that we were, we were really there. And he was right, but he didn't go quite far enough. The French and the British made clear to the State Department that they could not participate in this American vision of an integrated Western Europe uh, without American security guarantees. The French, in particular, raised some very sensible objections. They said, if we go down this route, we're not going to be economically self-sufficient. So what happens in five years' time when you go home and the West Germans cut off our coal supply? Or more likely, the Soviets take over Western Germany and they cut off our coal supplies. So you, you're going to have to provide this security. And uh, uh, a year and a day after the Marshall Aid legislation goes through, now April 4th, 1949, we pass the NATO Founding Act legislation. In fact, the State Department comes to refer to NATO as, quote unquote, a military ERP, European Recovery Program. That's the formal name of the Marshall Plan. And I argue in the book that the Marshall Plan and NATO really need to be seen as a combined whole. The Marshall Plan would never have succeeded without a security component. And to put that in a contemporary uh, context, in Iraq and Afghanistan already, we have spent on reconstruction aid alone over $200 billion. And we have virtually nothing to show for it economically or politically. Now, to put that number in context, $200 billion is more than 50% more than the totality of Marshall aid in current dollars. So it's not as if we haven't tried reconstruction aid. But the critical component that was missing in Iraq and Afghanistan was security, internal and external security. We were able to provide that to the Marshall countries. We have not been able to provide that in Iraq and Afghanistan. The second major factor I would emphasize is um, uh, German policy. The complete reversal of the horrible American occupation policy in Germany, the Morgenthau um, uh, plan. A lot of Western revisionist historians have bought into the Soviet line that the Marshall Plan was just a boondoggle for American uh, uh, exporters to dump their produce on Europe. Nothing of the sort. In fact, we consciously sacrificed our short-term export in, uh, uh, interest in the capital goods sphere in order to put Germany once again back in its traditional role in Europe as the main capital goods supplier in order to rebalance the European economy so they would not be dependent um, uh, on the U United States to make them once again um, uh, self-sufficient and balanced. And this, I think, had uh, an enormous effect this reintegration of Germany and the provision of security in terms of reviving private investment in Europe. Because it was at that point that people had confidence that they could in invest again, that Germany, the Soviet Union, would not um, um, uh, th um, threaten 
um, uh, their politics or their economic security. Now, to wrap things up, I'd like to take things a little closer to the um, uh, present day and ask what we could learn about the current period of U.S.-Russian relations from the Marshall period. Fast forward 40 years to November 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, historically, political upheaval in Germany has always had massive reverberations throughout the European continent. 1989 is no exception. Almost overnight, um, the Soviet alliances, such as they were, crumble. The Soviet security buffer shrinks um, back to the east, closer to Moscow than it had been since the 18th century. Meanwhile, the alliances that America created as part and parcel of the Marshall Plan, in particular NATO and the European Union, are as popular as ever. The newly liberated countries of Central and Eastern Europe are clamoring to get in. Uh, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev is extremely concerned about the possibility of eastward expansion of NATO to Russia's borders. Not so much because he believes that NATO is going to invade Russia, but he believes that it is going to give rise to nationalist forces in, in Russia, which are going to be destabilizing economically and politically. And he begs the United States not to go forward with an eastward expansion of NATO. At this point, I would argue that the United States had two logical options. One was the George Kennan option. George Kennan is still commenting on political affairs in the 1990s. He's now in his uh, 90s. Um, he argues that we should not think of expanding NATO. He says this is what we fought the Cold War for, for, to get to this point where the Soviets would abandon their Marxist ideology and we could keep them on a democratic track. Let us try to see if we can find a mutual understanding with the Russians about what sovereignty and independence will mean in Central and Eastern Europe. The other completely coherent view, very different from Kennan's, is the Republican view, the Dol Gingrich uh, view, reflected in the 1994 contract with America. Um, this argued that Russia will always be Russia. Uh, Kennan's got this wrong. Um, it will always threaten its neighbors, and the United States must provide uh, vital security guarantees to its um, uh, new, newly liberated friends in Central and Eastern Europe. That was also a defensible view. Bill Clinton, being Bill Clinton, chooses a third option. And that is to expand NATO under the premise that it has no adversary. He says that Russia is not an enemy of, um, uh, of uh, the United States or any part of um, uh, Europe, so we can expand Na uh, NATO into Central and Eastern Europe, and the American taxpayer won't have to worry about it because we won't have to put uh, additional uh, resources into reinforcing the new um, uh, eastern flank of uh, NATO. Um, George Kennan, now in 1997, he's age 93, condemns this strategy in the press. He says that it would, quote unquote, be the most fateful era of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. It will inflame nationalistic, anti-Western, and militaristic tendencies in Russian opinion, have an adverse effect on the development of Russian democracy, restore the atmosphere of Cold War to East-West relations, and impel Russian foreign policy in directions decidedly not to our liking. On the other side of the debate, State Department diplomat Richard Holbrook, he writes in 1998 that Kennan has this entirely wrong. He says, and I quote, the United States can have its cake and eat it too. He says, years from now, people will look back at the debate and wonder what all the fuss was about. They will notice that nothing has changed in Russia's relationship with the West. Now, I would argue that it is difficult to be more wrong than Richard Holbrook. <laughs> Why is this? Now, I would argue that the, if you look at the early Cold War disputes between the United States and the Soviet Union, they weren't so much driven by ideology. They were driven by geography. When it came to geostrategy, Stalin was a ruthless 
pragmatist, okay? He was concerned about his, um, his security, and I would argue that Putin's no different. Um, uh, of course, communism is uh, gone from Europe, but geography is the same. It hasn't changed in the least. I want to take a look at this um, uh, map. Um, this is a topographical map of Russia and its borderlands, but you'll notice something unusual about this map. North is on the bottom. Okay, so what I'm trying to get you to see is how a Russian politician sitting in Moscow might see Europe. And if you look at Russia's western border, what you see is thousands of miles of unprotected plains. That is, it's not protected by any major bodies of water or any mountains. Not surprisingly, Russia throughout history has been uh, subject to devastating um, invasions from the West. Napoleon invaded Russia from the, uh, from the West, went all the way to Moscow. Hitler invaded Russia from the West, went all the way to Moscow. So this is how Rus the Russian political establishment sees the expansion of NATO towards its borders as being an inherent um, uh, security uh, threat. So fast forward to the presidency of Vladimir Putin. He becomes president in 2000. His primary geostrategic aim has always been to restore the old Soviet political and economic space, and he considers NATO expansion to be the primary threat to this. And I think the, the nicest um, evidence of how he sees the conflict with the United States um, came out in 2016 in a private discussion that he had with former Israeli leader Shimon Peres. Peres in 2016, just before his death, does an interview where he recounts the conversation that he has with uh, Putin over the collapse in U.S.-Russian uh, relations. And here is what Putin tells um, Peres, and I'm quoting. What do the Americans need NATO for? The Soviet Union doesn't exist. The Warsaw Pact was dismantled. Why do they need Georgia and NATO? Why do they need Romania and NATO? Do they think I didn't know that Crimea is Russian and that Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine as a gift? I didn't care until they needed the Ukrainians and NATO. And what for? I didn't touch them. They wanted to go to Europe. I said, great, go to Europe. But why did they need them in NATO? These are not the words, I would argue, of an ideologue. They are the words of a ruthless pragmatist, and not even particularly ruthless by Russian standards. <laughs> Gorbachev, who is no friend of Putin's, supported the annexation of Crimea. He supported the occupation of Georgia. So coming back to Kennan and what he said in 1998, which I think was really prescient in describing the situation we have now, where we grossly underestimated Russia's reaction to NATO um, uh, expansion, he says, quote, we have signed up to protect a whole series of countries, even though we have neither the resources nor the intention to do so in any serious way. So coming back to the Marshall Plan to wrap up, I think the broader historical lesson is this. We remember the Marshall Plan today because it was visionary. But unlike NATO expansion after the supposed end of the Cold War, the Marshall Plan was actually hard-headed. And it succeeded because it was hard-headed. If we had defined success to include, for example, bringing Poland and Czechoslovakia into the Marshall Plan, we would have failed. The reason is we would have had to go to war with the Soviet Union to do it, and a central aim of the Marshall Plan was to defend our vital national interest in Europe without having to go to war again. So great acts of statesmanship like the Marshall Plan are not just grounded in idealism, they're grounded in realism. And this, I believe, is a lesson we need to relearn. Thank you so much for your time. We have four panelists tonight. What we'll do here is, as they're getting seated, 
um, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that was unintended when I started interviewing each of our panelists, but became quite apparent to me. There's three common themes that each of them have from their different perspectives. And then there's also some uh, alternating things. And those three common themes, one is about the strength of their mothers and how appropriate, as we take a look at celebrating Mother's Day, uh, the strength of each one of their mothers. They, uh, they took care of their families. For each of them, their fathers were gone. Either they were POWs um, or they were lost during the war for some time or away for some time. The, the second uh, thing that really came out to me uh, was the networks. There were global networks in the 40s. It's, it's amazing. And what I hear about, uh, not just within their own countries, but across Europe. And those networks were key for the survival of their families. And the third thing they have in common is the inspirational hope that America provided at the end of the war and then through the Marshall Plan. And uh, they all came eventually to America and uh, appreciate uh, the freedoms and also are very pro-American, probably more pro-American than most folks that were born here. Um, some of the things that were sort of different, um, there's a certain faith aspect you're gonna hear uh, a little bit, how um, faith was very important, that was almost providential um, and helped in their perseverance. Um, and one of our gentlemen here was really about his strength, and he was farmed out for doing quite a few different things. He was a hard worker. And then we also have a gentleman that had some interesting trade skills that he was able to uh, use to a great effect. So now what we'll do is we're going to uh, do a uh, brief introduction. Okay, up on the top is my family as we were in... Uh, 1947, right after the war, without my father, because my because my my father was in the war and he had been a prisoner of the Russians. So that's my family up on top. Below that is uh, my sisters and I, living in Stefanstorf, which is in Silesia, near the town of uh, Breslau, which was the capital of Silesia. Below here is a picture of the tall man in the back, is my father who was in the Luftwaffe in the reserve, and that was at one of his meetings with all his buddies drinking beer. <laughs> Up on top, of course, is my husband and I, Jim. Uh, on the side there is a picture of my home in Stefanstorf, which was taken, uh, which is now in Poland. It was taken about 1990 by a friend of ours. Below that is my dad's passport picture. And in the center is our family with my dad. And that was our immigration picture. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to Paul. The picture down here is a family from, uh, in the, from the uh, time in, uh, under the Hitler time, before we were uh, invaded by the Russian. Later on top is a picture just taken the other way. In the corner up there is a picture from when I had to join the Hitler Youth. And on the bottom here, is, I brought that up. Uh, I have my whole history actually in, in a worker's book. Every worker has a book where he registered, where he worked from what day to the other day. It came very much handy for my social security and, and things like this. I, my whole life uh, after the war ended up more in farming because we had a large family, seven children. I was the oldest and I, in the beginning I worked as a cut wood, as a wood cutter. And then uh, later on I was pretty much run down. My mother sent me on a farm where I worked and uh, uh, to bring also food to, on the table to my family. The, thing was uh, that you needed to uh, learn a job. In Germany, everything goes apprenticeship. No matter what you do, even if you're a sales lady, 
in a store, you have to go three years to learn this profession. So getting me, I didn't even finish school because I was only 16 years old when the war was over. So uh, I thought after two years working on a farm, I make agriculture my future. So I only had to go one more year, then I can make my apprenticeship, and later on, this apprenticeship I did also. In, but I want to keep it short, because we're just explaining the picture. Uh, here's a picture on the bottom uh, in, in, in East Germany, working on a farm. And uh, you can still see the Panzer, army Panzer, army cap. That was the only thing you could wear and find. And later on in my life, I emigrated, not emigrated as a exchange student to Finland, where I worked also on a farm. And that's a picture from up there. So that's so far I've seen gift. Thank you, Paul. Now we're going to go to Ebby. Thank you, Mark. Starting at the top left is are my army discharge papers. I was fortunate enough speaking German fluently. Where would you send me? Hawaii. <laughs> Upper left. <laughs> I was part of the Tropical Lightning Division, the 25th Infantry Division, stationed at Schofield Barracks. And before, after that, I became with the, uh, obviously, I'd been a draftee, had to serve six years. Two years active, two years inactive reserve, and I joined the Army National Guard, the 48th Division, then the Viking Division. Bottom left is me as a young folk. I had to join when you were 10. That's the precursor to Hitler, you just like Cub Scouts to Boy Scouts. So Hitler taught me how to march, and I came over here, I had to march some more. <laughs> I marched, I learned to march under two different flags. Top center is my wife and I, and uh, we were born uh, uh, in the same town, Baptist, baptized and confirmed by the same pastor, and we left Germany at seven years apart. And where did we meet? Where did we find our pot of gold? Here in St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> where we re obviously got reacquainted and married. To the right is our current family, my son, Steve, on the left, and, uh, and daughter-in-law, Beth Bulak, grandson at the bottom, me on the right with my wife and another grandson, Max, this granddaughter, Margaret, on the left, upper top is Dakota, the top center right is our daughter and Tommy, grandson. Five grandchildren and uh, a boy and a girl, a daughter and son, and two grand, uh, two two son-in-laws. One son-in-law was not, and I picture this time. At that time, my daughter was divorced. We're going to give Len another shot at this. Let's keep the lights down so that we can actually see Len's uh, Len's picture. I'm going to let you. Oh, here. Sorry. There you go. Well, the reason uh, I think I was asked to show some of my family is to uh, talk later after economic speech, oh, yeah. <laughs> how great America is. And this is part of the greatness of America. We came, four of us, and then I had met my wife, whose uh, maiden name was Hampton. I told her I'm a Polish nobleman, and she said I'm an American noblewoman. So I said, let's get married. <laughs> she was a fantastic wife and mother, and those are my younger kids. Now, this little guy over here now is a colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve. And <laughs> okay, and as the oldest Steve over there on my right, he was a JAG in the Marine Corps. Uh, let's see. <laughs> and then later on, the se second generation of Jankowskis, we had a big reunion of all my cousins and my children and their children and grandchildren. 
and this is where I live right now. I brought in a picture of me as a naval aviator. Okay, so you've, uh, you've met uh, our panelists tonight. Uh, what I want to start with is, uh, Len, right at the end of the war, tell us about uh, what happened, this, the situation with your family, and you were in the Soviet-occupied zone in 1939. Yeah, we were occupied by the Russians in 39, uh, September 15th, and my, parent, my father was a minister in eastern Poland, and my mother, of course, was, came to America, so she was a suspect for the Russian secret police to be arrested and sent to Siberia. Now, you call it gulag because of Shoshanitsyn, but everybody in Europe, especially eastern Europe, knows what Siberia means. It's a penalty. And that's how they kill you, the Russians. They will freeze you to death and work you to death and starve you to death. And so we were occupied by the Russians. And this is the first time I have to say thank you to Hitler. And what? because if it wasn't for Hitler, I would have been dead in Siberia. But they attacked on the 22nd of June. And my mother was, or in the meantime, my dad had to run away from the Russian part of Poland to the German side of Poland. So my mother was left alone with two little kids. And she was told later, a few days later, that the train was in town, Rumno, that they, and her name was on the list to be arrested and sent to Siberia. This is how close it was. So I, I have to say, thank you, Hitler. <laughs> Uh, that was not in the script. Um, uh, I don't think it's going to be in the script, but we're going to keep it in there. But I, when I heard Len's story, I interviewed Len, I don't know, like three or four times, and he was interviewing me. Uh, I just found it as being really supernatural. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen that are not by accident in your life, and how, how you made it here, and getting, no, you got to wait. Uh, we got to go to somebody else now. So we're going to go to Dorothea, and Dorothea, tell me just a little bit about uh, your family. You guys went on an ox cart trek, correct? Okay. Uh, my family consisted of uh, seven children, my mom and dad, and of course my dad had been drafted and he was serving in the Luftwaffe. My dad was always very, very proud that he never fired a gun during his whole time in the service. Uh, he was what you call an airplane spotter. He had to go ahead and look at the airplanes and identify the type of aircraft that they were flying. So my dad was in the war. Mom and us five kids were living in a little town called Stefansdorf near Breslau, which I said before is in, is, uh, in Silesia. Uh, the people were coming through our town and and we were asking them, where are you all going? Because they were all coming with oxen and uh, pulling wagons. And so they said, well, you better pack up and get ready too because the Russians are right behind us. My mom, having five of us little ones, the littlest one being six months old, the oldest one being 12, so she packed us up, took two suitcases, got on a train, and we left for the West. We went to my aunt's house. She dropped us off. She left us there to go back home again to get some more belongings, but they couldn't get through because the Russians were already in the town. So the uncle decided as long as the Russians are this close, he better go ahead and pack us all up, and we had a wagon that was pulled by two oxen, and my aunt and her three children, us six, another lady and her daughter, all went on this wagon. But my mother walked most of the way across Germany because my little brother was in a baby buggy and he, there wasn't room for him on the wagon, so sh she had to push him. So this is this is baby Wolfgang is is being pushed in a baby baby buggy by your mom as you're going from Breslau to the west. Right. And my baby brother Wolfgang who was in the United States Army later on was born on the 4th of July. How how appropriate. Yeah. Now now Paul, you guys also were planning to have an ox cart trek, correct? 
It wasn't actually an ox cart track because we owned a lemonade factory and we had horses at that time. Also, we had also uh, uh, cars already too, you know, for delivering the goods. So we, when, when the Russian came close to us, because they came really fast, because we were living just a few miles away from the Oder border, where the Germans uh, then finally stopped the Russian invasion. But from Warsaw to the Oder, there was no hold. But there was hardly any resistance of the German side, because Hitler took all the uh, soldiers and put them over on the Western Front, you know the Battle of the Bulge. That's where he in, had all these tanks and all the ammunition to show his um, uh, things over there. So the Russian came really fast through. Our, my father was also in the army, but he was stationed in the middle of Poland. And he, we still talked by telephone on the 16th of January. And just a couple of weeks later, on the 30th, the Russian was already in our town. We had planned leaving also with a wagon and two horses. We had everything on the wagon, but like I said, everything went so fast. We heard already gunshots and cannon north and south of us. So we thought it might be not impossible to get even out. And getting out into to the uh, combat zone with the family wouldn't be a good uh, thing. So we. We stayed home and uh, been under the Russian occupation uh, for the end, till the end of the war on May 8. So, Paul, you guys planned to go, but she ended up staying. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now we're going to move over to Ebby. Ebby, you were in Stuttgart. <laughs> yes, um, the war ended for me when I was 11 years old on April 25, 1945. As you know, Stuttgart was being bombed for about a year and a half, almost on a daily basis by the Brits. They came at night. Americans came during the daytime because the, the B-17s, the B-24s could fly at a higher altitude. So our, the only time there were no, no air raids was when it was raining or snowing. Or they, they couldn't see. There was no there was cloud cover. But whenever the sun was out or blue skies, we knew that automatically there was going to be bombing raids. They're going after the Mercedes Benz plants, Stuttgart, Bosch was there, and the Autobahn was next to our town and the airport. So either the Stuttgart was bombed or the Autobahn and the airport. So when the war ended, for me, it said, no more bombs. Finally, I might get to be, become an old man. Because, and, and no more bombs, and finally also the time is coming for us now, finally we can get enough food to eat to fill our hungry stomachs when you're growing up as a young person, you know, you're always hungry. And you have, you have food rations, but the rations didn't entitle you to any food. Sometimes you got in line, there was nothing on the shelves, nothing to be had, even though you had the ration cards and the money. And we were liberated by the free French. There were primarily uh, uh, foreign legion. There were uh, French colonial troops, Moroccans, Tunisians, Algerians. And they felt that to the victors belonged the spoils. They took anything they liked. And they were obviously, we had to hide the young women, the girls, we had to hide the women. And I was sexually assaulted by a Moroccan soldier. He held the, a knife to my throat is, and obviously gave me the idea that if you squeal or holler, help or call for help, I'll be that person. I was 11 years old. So that was how we, we were liberated. At least no more bombs. Uh, thank you, Abby. Um, uh, I'm reminded when, whenever I do interviews um, prior to this and during this, it, it reminds me of uh, a lot of things that, that, that you all experienced in the past, but a lot of our service members have experienced over the last, uh, the last number of years. And, and uh, uh, it became apparent during Vietnam about post-traumatic stress. And that uh, various 
different traditions, different people have different ways of dealing with it. And sometimes we suppress these things, we hide them because we're ashamed or we're made to feel ashamed. But we have found uh, through, I think, e extensive uh, experience and research in mental health that talking about your experiences and sharing those, not just with your family members or your comrades if it's combat related, but these other traumatic things, that the healing process, and as we're humans, we're, we're we have a side to us that needs other human empathy and understanding. And so we're going to get, there's a couple of stories tonight that we will have where we're going to have some tears and we'll have some issues. And, uh, and that's okay because this is the human experience and this is part of the healing. Even, even when you're in your, your 80s or your 90s, um, these things still have much effect. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move over uh, and talk to you, Dorothea. Uh, about um, you had some, you're eight years old uh, on this trek, seven. and uh, okay, seven, and uh, you're entering Dresden, and you saw and experienced almost all the different senses. You saw, you smelled, you felt death, and can you explain w what that was like for for a seven year old girl as she's moving? Because some of it was was like you were playing, you were on a trip. But when you saw these things, it became real to you. Uh, two nights before we got to Dresden, we were staying overnight in a German women's army barracks. The parents were all inside and all of us kids were outside playing and we noticed the red sky. And we were so excited, we had never seen a sky that red before. And so we were running around like chickens with our heads cut off and kept saying, come out and see the red sky. You've never seen anything like that. It's got to be the most beautiful sunset. It is just awesome. It's just awesome. And our parents were trying to calm us down because we got just too excited. And two days later, we were, this trek was supposed to go to Dresden and meet up with other treks that were already in Dresden. When we got to Dresden, it was, like he said, it's, it's hard to talk about it because the fact that, first of all, uh, it was all, everything had been bombed out. There's ashes all, I mean, the ashes were so thick on the ground that the oxen had a hard time getting through that. We saw dead bodies, skeletons on trees. We saw people laying in the streets all over, just burnt skeletons and the stench. It was unimaginable. You can't imagine what it's like for a seven-year-old to come into a town that's all devastated, all burnt to the ground, and then see dead bodies. And to this day, and I'm 80 years old, but to this day, when I talk about it and think about it, I can still smell it. That uh, that is that is so uh, the imagery that you've described is 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 so alive. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about moms now and how your moms helped you uh, through this. And uh, Dorothea, can we can we talk about your mom? And uh, I, I call your story blessed because I got choked up on it. My mom. Oh, my whole family. We were we were brought up in the church, and by the way, during the war, we were told because my dad did not join the Hitler Party, we could no longer go to church, receive communion, or have anything to do with the church. So we were more or less uh, looked down because they looked down at us because of the fact we weren't going to church. Uh, my mom's faith was so strong that she had to go ahead and push, push us practically across Germany. And with a little guy 
that was six months old, trying to keep him dry, trying to keep him fed. She begged, borrowed, and stole along the way milk from the farmers, whatever she could get to go ahead and feed him. He was, we always felt us kids, he was the most important of the whole family, which as kids, we just kind of more or less thought, well, he's always getting the food, we're not, you know. But anyway, one night we stopped at a castle. We slept overnight in barns, schools, wherever we could, and this night we slept in a castle. And there was a moat that went around the castle with water in it, <coughs> and that night my mom had the breakdown. She she put us all down to bed, and we all had lice in our hair. I mean, we were just, we must have looked a sight. But anyway, she put us down to bed, and she went out in the moat, and she said, she just prayed and prayed and prayed, and she said, God, you have to show me the way. I don't know where to go from here. I don't know how to feed my kids. I don't know how to keep them clean. I don't know what's gonna happen. So she decided, well, there was water going around the moat and she thought, well, this would be a nice way to end it all. And she was gonna go ahead and pitch us all into the water. But lucky for us, God stepped in and said, no, Frida, you have to go on, you have to keep these kids safe for when Henry comes back from the war. You're gonna have to be there with the kids. So, so my mother said, if it hadn't been for the almighty God, she would have drowned all of us. We're glad you're here with us tonight. Me too. <laughs> so we're talking about mothers. And, uh, and Len, tell us about your, your, your mom and how she led you. <clears throat> well, during the 20s, there was a big revival in uh, Poland. And because my uncle served in a legion that the French put together at the end of the First World War, when the Russians attacked Poland in 1919, uh, we beat them. Uh, I think we're the only ones in a couple centuries that defeated the Russians, communists. And there was exchange of prisoners. And at that time, my father and the rest of the clan were in Siberia. And so they came back to, to Poland. And then my dad became a Christian and went to a Bible school in Germany and before, in the middle of the early 30s. My mother came to America to Moody Bible Institute. And so I'm telling you how God was moving on my family and my parents. They got married in 34, and I told you already that we were occupied by the Russians. And so my dad had to run away, but he had a whole bunch of German Christian friends. So they were taking care of him when he escaped to Polish, to German side of Poland. They worked, after Hitler attacked Russia, they worked for two years before the German Red Cross arranged for my mother and two of the, you know, my sister and I to come to Germany. And so we're on this train that's full of German soldiers. I think the compartment that we were, my mother and my sister and I, was full of like maybe eight German officers. And they would stop every half hour, and supposedly go to the restroom or buy coffee. With, that was the excuse officially given, if I remember correctly. I was only seven years old on this trip. And, and I, and I, I didn't connect all the dots until about 10 years ago. Um, but the Polish underground was the most efficient underground in Europe. And we tied up over 10 German divisions in Poland. And, a, and they would blow up such a train. And so they would stop every half hour to check the track to see if it's safe. And well, this one of the German officer stayed behind and then go off the train wondering who is this woman with two little kids and so he started talking to her in German she says I don't speak German so he tried French <clears throat> you know every educated person in Europe speaks <laughs> French right and she says I don't speak French and so then he tries English on her she said yeah I speak English and he said is there something I can do for you and she said yes <clears throat> my husband 
and their German friends in Berlin don't know we're coming. Give me their address. I'll send a telegram at the next stop. So when we got to Berlin railroad station, there was my dad and, and the, the German friends. <laughs> so they took care of us. We are, I am kind of unique that most Poles, Ukrainians, Russian, French, they were slave laborers. They were forced by the Germans to come to Germany. We did not go that way. We were uh, taken care of by my dad's German friends. And so we were behind, we were outside the barbed wire. The factory we wound up at had about 118 year old Russian girls working, making fuel tanks for panzers. I don't, English, you would say making tanks for tanks, right? That doesn't uh, sound good. So I have to use. You know what a panzer is, right? I think everybody here knows. There's it. some economic <laughs> equation in there. Okay. But, uh, and so, uh, and he was the, the owner was a Christian. So the kid, the, the the way these slave laborers were treated, depending on a German company, if the management was humane, they got along fine. Krupp was the worst. I mean, they were really not feeding corrupt. well. Krupp uh, was corrupt. Krupp was corrupt. That was well, maybe <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> etc. Et <clears throat> so we were liberated by Americans on April one, which was Easter that year. And to to say I partially disagree about this Marshall Plan and NATO and that we caused the Cold War. <clears throat> when we met, uh, we had a ball. Uh, a, some bread in the basement that my mother hid, and the GIs found it, and they took it. And so my mother walks up to the first lieutenant, who was a platoon commander, I suppose, and said, you know, we're no Germans, and you took our last bread. They loaded us up with all the American food. You know, we had the best Easter in 45, <laughs> April 1. And so, and then we stayed in refugee camps until 49. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna go this way, Paul. Paul, I I, I termed your mom the mastermind. She had a way of uh, taking her eldest son and putting him to work, making things happen with the family. Tell us about what happened when the Russians came and how your mom organized things. Actually, when the Russian came, I had a similar experience. I never talked about that before either. We actually had poison to poison the whole family when the Russian comes up. In the, but unfortunately, uh, I never found it. I put it away someplace, but I couldn't find it when the time was right. But anyway, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And we survived all, all my seven, uh, we seven siblings and my mother survived the war. So when the Russian came in, I mean, it was a very hard time. We had to no food, I mean, we had our food, what we just regularly had, but there was no food for the future. Because up till the end of World War II, there was nobody to feed us. So during the war, we, uh, during this time, we went out to the bakery, got flour, we went to the mayor, got milk and whatever we could find to eat. And uh, like I told Mark too, we lived close to a school which was converted into a, a, a hospital for all the Russian soldiers there. And since we lived so close to the front for three months, and uh, yeah, for three months, we had all the wounded people there and they came at night, they was awake and they came in, in the house and looked for good worlds and all that, you know. Uh, your, your mom, your mom. Yeah, my mom, is, uh, like I said, uh, she was uh, uh, the Russian. I have two things. She, she have the women in them was number one. They loved music and they liked children. So we put uh, in our house, we put cluster all people from other who was there. We lived all in big bunches to have more protection. The more people you have, and the more you could hide also the young girls in the background. My brother, he was only three years old. He was trained the moment the Russian comes in our house, in our living quarters, he approached them so that they got ideas of other, for other things than not looking for girls. 
And my mother was a good pianist. She, she could play the piano. And we had months, sometimes we had good times with people. We even were singing songs and all that when, if we could. But uh, mostly they came for the women. And I had to go to the whole house with the Russian, you know. And then, and the Russian, they didn't look under the bed if, if a woman was hiding. They took the MP, uh, machine gun and uh, sprayed bullet all over there. And in, also in closets. So uh, then uh, when we finally, uh, I mean, after a while then, got a little bit more organized, but, but we still, until the end of the war, they, we still had these Russian almost every night at our house. But uh, then they needed also labor. I was, uh, uh, maybe I should tell the story, I was uh, drafted by the Russian to take care of the uh, horses they captured from the Germans. They had big places where they had the horses. And we kids, we was uh, in charge of feeding them and make sure that they are tied down and all that. And that I did that for several days. And uh, it was early in February then. And uh, one night I laid down on a hail bell and, and, and next morning when I woke up, I woke up in the snow and I got a terrible cold. I got really sick and uh, the Russian the veterinarian, uh, he sent me home um, so that I can get healed up. And that was also a save in my life because when I came back after I was well enough to come back, they was all gone. They had to bring these horses all to Russia. Everybody had three horses on each side and had to walk them to Russia. I found out from a person who lived in our house too. She was one of, was a girl that time. She, uh, she got so sick on the track in Poland, she got, that the Russian just pushed her in a ditch and let her say, and somebody else took over for the horses. So she found some nice people in Poland who put her back to wealth so that she could walk home and told the story. That otherwise, I never would have found out what happened to these yeah. horses, yeah. Anything else you want? That's good, Paul, thanks. We're gonna to go to Ebby now, and if you can tell us about your mom and then uh, uh, what happened to your house uh, in Stuttgart. Yes, as you heard before, the moms during the war, all the able-bodied men between 16 and 40 were out fighting the war somewhere in Europe, North Africa, or Norway, Russia, have up to Moscow, as we heard before. So the moms were really the household, they were in the families. In, in one case, we heard that we had warning that the British were coming at night to bomb the Stuttgart airport. And when they come from England, they only have one chance to, to drop their bombs and then return back home, back to England. Stuttgart is in the southwestern portion of Germany. They were going after the Stuttgart airport. There was one uh, Geschwader of ME 109s. Those were the German fighter planes stationed there. And they came, they bombed that airport at least once a week, if not more often. Well, that, it, they came at night, as I mentioned before, the bridge to, to drop flares on parachutes. That night, the wind was so strong, it blew all the flares over our town. We're uh, a, a living a suburb of Stuttgart. We're a residential community, no industry whatsoever. A few stores, some farms, and so on. Of course, there were the flares, were, the wind blew them all over the town, and they weren't gonna take the bombs back. They had no chance for a second run. Obviously, so they let us have it. All our schools were bombed. 80% of the houses were wiped out. My mom had the intuition that night, because my dad was I fighting the, was with the German occupation forces in Marseille, France. She, she had three kids and one she was carrying out, my little brother. She was pregnant in her, she was five months pregnant. She said, let's go to the neighbor's house. They're, wine cellar was deeper than ours. It was an older home. And there was a man in the house because they had a nursery and they had the vegetable garden. So he was part of, he had to raise food for the, for the community, uh, cabbage and radishes and carrots, whatever, you know, veggies. Besides, he had flat feet, so he couldn't march very good. 
So he stayed home. So she felt more secure having a man when uh, uh, air raid that was uh, assumed to be the airport, and obviously. So we went to that to the neighbor's house that night, and obviously the bombs were dropping left and right, and the noise, and there were the ground was shaking just like an earthquake. And we had the, 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 the stone walls in the side, the, the ground shook and vibrated, that the mortar fell out of the mortar joints. And I thought, we're going to be hit next to no, the I mean, and the noise was unbearable. Well, luckily, we, we were spared. When the when air, air raid was over, it was all clear. We got up, our house was in flames, and it was gone, totally gone. So that was the, the intuition of a mom. Yeah. They had to carry the load. And Emmy, Emmy, please tell us about your favorite American president and Elephant and Rhodes. Oh, <laughs> we talked about the Marshall Plan. What about the Hoover Plan? You know, we after the war, the Marshall Plan was geared to build up the industries in all the devastated countries like Germany, and not only Germany, France, and Poland, right? to some degree. Uh, Italy, of course, and, and England. Harry Truman said, uh, he called his friend Herbert Hoover. Truman, we knew, was a, a Democrat. Herbert Hoover was a uh, Republican. He was president in the 40s, in the 30s, before FDR. Hoover was a Quaker. And he obviously he, he had Quaker oats. He said, we got to do something about the starving kids. They were all mistreated during the war. They're all malnourished. They're all hungry. They're, they're, they didn't get enough food and vitamins in their system, and they're growing. Their growing bodies are hurting. So Herbert Hoover, they emptied uh, all the, the shelves of Quaker old meals and sent them to Europe. And if any one of you have ever gone to Iowa, where Herbert Hoover was born, there's his museum. And there are, you can see letters from t different school kids uh, thanking Hoover for keeping them alive. And what, what it did, we, we had to bring a, a little tin cup to school every day at noon. We were fed uh, oatmeal. And we were obviously oatmeal by itself without any flavor, all sugar in it, without uh, you know whatever fruit with it and the banana with it. But it, it kept us alive. I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of kids wouldn't be alive today without Hoover, the Hoover Plan. And, and you know, that's, that's one thing that's never promoted in this country. We call it the, 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 the Hoover, Spe Hoover, Hoover Spice or Hoover Plan in Germany. Maybe uh, somebody's not on their heads. So you must have had some of that stuff. It looked ugly. It looked god ugly. It looked almost as bad as if you've been to Hawaii, the poi. You know, it looks gray and ugly. But oh, if you're hungry, you eat it, boy. And uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Eva. Now we're going to go to Len. Len, we want to we want to talk. You were no, not well, not quite yet. I know we're going to get well. We just you were in uh, a camp in the British zone. And tell us about uh, when the, uh, the communists came to, to do a little recruiting. Well, we had a half a million Polish army uh, fighting under Montgomery against the Germans. And so they couldn't treat us like they treated the Russian and Ukrainians, uh, slave labor after the war ended. They allowed the Americans and British committed a crime, I think, by allowing the Russians to come into their zones and force these Russian and Ukrainians to go back. Uh, now, after two years, the communists took over Poland, and they used to apparently force the British to allow them to come to our camp per to persuade us to go back to Poland. And we finally got sick and tired of these commies coming, and we told them we were threatening their lives because there was, you know, we guns all over the place. By the way, I, I played as a 10-year-old boy with uh, German artillery because it was parked all over Germany <laughs> after the war. So it was fun. And we threatened them. So they used to come with the British armored cars with the British soldiers at the machine guns at the ready and the, the commies 
poles in the middle in the limos and a couple more armored cars in behind to guard these guys. And they didn't get very far with us. <clears throat> and uh, so that's one thing that happened. Okay, very good. And uh, yeah, we talked about, we hope we're not gonna cause any, any problems with our NATO allies from some of our conversations here. But uh, obviously the, the French and the British are not turning out so well. Or, and then our, our allies during the war, the Russians. But uh, now moving on, um, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about all the different activities that you did once you got to Bavaria. You kids were pretty active to, to find food. We had to be, but I just want to ask, your name was what, Ebert? Eberhard. Eberhard. Eberhard, you were lucky you got oats, oats to eat. We just got flour. We had flour soup, everything, some water, some salt, and some flour. And that was our soup almost every night. And now when I go ahead and I tease my sisters and we talk about going out to lunch or something, I'll just say, you know, maybe if we're lucky, we'll, they'll serve us some flour soup. <laughs> and it's not funny, we know, but... Uh, Okay, when we got to Bavaria, we were living on a farm. We had two rooms. Uh, the mayor put us on a farm with two rooms that were empty. The barn was next door where the cows were. The chickens lived in our room. We had to chase them out. There was a table in there and a chair, no bed. My sister and my brothers slept in the barn on straw. Uh, and what our activity was every day was scrounging or looking for food. We went into the woods, we found berries, we found mushrooms. My mother would make good mushroom soup. Uh, we'd even go ahead and raid the neighbor's apple trees or pear trees. One time, my mother sent us out to get apples, and she said, we can go ahead and harvest these apples for the winter. Well, how was she gonna do that? Well, she was gonna go ahead and cut these apples up, put them in, in slice, cut them in slices, and then one of us was to go up on the roof, which was, the roof came down pretty far in the backyard, so one of us could climb up on the roof, lay them up there so they would dry, and she would harvest them for the winter so we'd have food. Well, I was the one that had to go up on the roof. Uh, it wasn't too long after I'd gotten up on the roof, and I fell down, and Underneath the roof, there was a fence, and the fence was made out of pickets that were, the spikes were carved from branches or trees or whatever. I fell into them and, of course, tore my lip, so I have a nice scar to remind me of Bavaria. Uh, as far as gleaning the fields, we would go out and just cover the fields, look for potatoes, beets. Uh, we'd go behind the coal trains and make sure that some of the coal would come off. Uh, the, my brother Hans was the one that could climb up and have some fall off so we could gather it up and take it home. We'd scrounge the woods for any, any kind of wood, branches, anything we could find so my mother would be able to heat the kitchen or heat the water that she was getting out of the pump. We had an out, outdoor toilet, we had outdoor water. Uh, basically, it was like camping. So it was fun? No. No, but it was unfun camping. We're going to go to Paul, and Paul, if you can talk, there's an event that happened on 23 June 45 uh, in Lonsburg. Okay. Uh, since we just talked about soup, I have to bring my soup story too. We didn't have flour soup. We, you, you have a big pot of water and then you shred one potato and put it in. The starch will make it more heavier like a soup. And then you find somehow some aroma to 
bigger taste than there. That was our food for many, many months, and our one of our main food. And, and you was, uh, what was your question? Uh, no. Mark. But you was a uh, question. Oh, oh, yeah, my, I forgot. I was so enthused with yeah. soup making. I'm going home and peeling tape. Oh, oh, the 23rd, oh, yeah. uh, you know, like I said, we was on a Russian occupation, but then uh, I worked also for the Russian to bring potatoes. You know, in, in, in German farmers, they have the potatoes in the field under straw and to protect them from the winter and earth over there and so that they can have, get them to the, field, to the public in the, in the springtime when there are no, no potatoes growing. So I was also with a wagon, we got uh, potatoes mostly from the western part of where our city was. And I, one day I was surprised that I saw the, the village was all empty. There was no people in there. And uh, then I finally found one. I said, what's going on here? What happened to the people? He said, yeah, we all had to leave. They came yesterday and kicked us all out. We had to go to the new Germany, on the other side of the order. So, and you, you coming up tomorrow, they will kick you. Because they started from the order and went backwards so that the people didn't know. So the next day on the 23rd, uh, they came to us and we had to leave our house in 10 minutes. And we, somebody from the refugees left the old heavy cart, what was actually pulled by a horse. We took this, this little, just little wheel, steel wheels on there. We put some of our belongings on there and then we had to leave and uh, went up to the west. We made it almost to the River Oda, we stayed the night before there, and then the next day, but the nights was terrible because that, that's where all the fighting was. There was no houses where you could sleep. You looking for root, root cellars, you know, or sink cellars, you know, where, where you can stay in the ditches. And then we made it to our end in Frankfurt on the Oda, but we could could not stay in Frankfurt either because Frankfurt is also like uh, a divided city, you know, some part of it is on the other side, now Polish side. So they had to take all the refugees from, from their own city. So Paul, can you please tell us, everybody here is experiencing hunger. And this is 45 going into 46, yeah. 47. So what did your mom do with you to, to help solve some of the families? Uh, ration problems. Oh, oh, that came near later. The, what I said already later on, I worked on, we kids worked on farms and too, when we were there, they settled in in uh, Thuringen already, close to the new German, West Germany, but it was still East Germany because it was captured by the American, but they had to give it away in to get a part of Berlin. That was the arrangement. So, and, and, and uh, I mean, food was always the number one, you know, we never had food, like I said, that was our main dish, the soup we had all the time. And uh, we came, uh, or maybe a nice story too, because nobody wants to take a family with seven children, you know. Everything was destroyed, the cities, there was no room and so forth. And when we finally made the decision going to Eisenach, we had, my mother said to the, they wouldn't even let us from the railroad station into the city. So my mother said, I leave the children here as collateral, but I have to see my girlfriend in a city. So she went ahead, but we know she never will come back. <laughs> <laughs> so when evening came, then we got all, all wild and you know, was the little kids were crying for the mom, you know. They finally let us go, otherwise we wouldn't have found a place. We, we, my mother stayed for a long time there with the kids in, in East Germany, in Thüringen, in Eisenach, and Martin Luther's Stadt, where the Wartburg is. And uh, one of one went over to the West, escaped to the West. Except my brother and his sister, they stayed there until the you know, EU vindication. Okay, okay. The, the the story I was thinking of is your you got hired out to do lumberjacking. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Why don't we talk about that? Because that that has a direct effect to deal with the hunger. Okay. When we came uh, then in Thuringen, we we had to we got an apartment way on top. Actually, it was not an apartment. It was just a, underneath the roof. You know, there was just a one two two little rooms, and the bathroom was in the basement. Basement we had to go there, but like we needed also firewood because the winter is coming for heating and also for the stove to burn things. So the thing was, I was, uh, uh, my mother gave, uh, got me a job as a lumberjack uh, and there you could get wood, you know, you could get wood and you bring every night a bag full branches you can find, even so it was even hard to find that because all the people went in the woods to cut branches. and. Uh, uh, I was condemned, actually, there was just another young fellow. I don't know why he was there, but the rest of all these people was always, was all Nazis who had the big official. They was condemned by the Russian to work as lumbers to, to cut woods. And uh, you know, the Russian system has, you have to do so much each day. And uh, unfortunately, many of these older people already who never worked in their life with a hand, they couldn't make it. So we had to make up for them, help them out. Otherwise, if we didn't get our norm, what they call for per day done, we, we had to stay almost all night, you know. This was, uh, and, and, and after this, uh, I did that only for half a year, and oh, I, that was, imp uh, I got the highest ration cards. There was, I think, five ration cards, and I got the highest one because it was one of the hardest jobs. And I got, the, and uh, I lived. I was in the one room with my sister. It was just a small room, and there, uh, my kids, say, my my sisters, little sisters, they got kind of mad that my mother gave me something more to eat. Even so, I deserved it. So I got a little nervous breakdown as a young child and as a young guy with 16 years said she uh, found a job for me on a farm where I, what I told you already before, where, where I put my, later on my uh, uh, education and everything in, you know, also to bring food home for, for the weekend to, on the tables. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I, I've got I've got somebody that really wants to talk about economics, or he said he's going to get up and leave. So I, I've got okay. I just want to say that the German woods, the floors, the grounds of the German woods were never so clean because there wasn't a leaf or a branch on the floor because we all gathered all that to go ahead and and put in our stoves. Oh, that's good. You guys were like vacuum cleaners in the yeah, forest. Sure. You, you took care of it. Okay, there's a, a hue and outcry for economics. We must talk economics. Uh, we're going to use the term black market. It's, that, that's how the conversation went here, but uh, technically the, a black market is an illegal activity. Uh, but what we're really talking about is more barter for goods and services in, because the monetary system was not working or it lost value. Uh, Len, you had a unique situation uh, where you weren't as hungry as, as the other folks here and you got some special care packages. What'd you do with them? Well, uh, are we, you want me to talk about economics? Uh, <coughs> that, that part of economics. <coughs> well, <laughs> you've heard about you care packages. Care, and we use, my mother had a friend in, Can, in Toronto who used to send us two care packages. And we used most of it on ourselves. But my folks didn't drink coffee or we didn't smoke cigarettes. And I was able to forego one Hershey bar that my mother would give me and sell it on the black market. And so at one time, she, I needed a new suit because I was growing, 10 years old, I think, at the time. And so she had to sell two pounds of coffee that came in these care packages, which was equivalent to 1,100 marks. And a typical average German at that time, th this is after the war, like 47, 48, <clears throat> was making 250 marks a month. 
And so it took 1,100 marks to buy the material and hire a tailor to make me a suit. And it was pretty cheap. In the suits up here, right? <clears throat> over there, if you, way over in the corner there. I'm in the middle over there. This is a, this is a two pound coffee <clears throat> suit, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> yeah. And I'm, do you want me telling me how rich I am today? Uh, you go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> get, 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 I'm probably yeah. the richest oh. guy over here. I hold in my hands 2.6 million marks. <clears throat> And he's, he's do you think it's do you think you think it's worth anything? No. <clears throat> That's it is inflation. And uh, if I could quickly tell you, economics consists of twenty-five uh, words or less. Uh, land, <laughs> labor, and capital. And I added the fourth one, and I think the the speaker this evening also implied the fourth one. It is trust in the system in the money. This is just plain paper, it's worthless. And when I came to America, you could buy a Hershey bar, a chewing gum, ice cream cone, and a coffee, I mean a Coke bottle for a nickel. How much do we pay for it now? <clears throat> you pay chewing gum, what, two dollars? A Coke, <laughs> you know, you that doing? is inflation. And so Marshall Plan, was necessary to do the fourth thing, to create trust in this money. So the German government, and remember, what's the name of the American general? He was really Clay. the... Clay. 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 He was really the big boss of Germany until 53. Whatever Adenauer and Eberhard and the other prime minister decided, he could veto it. And so Marshall Plan developed a trust into the German mark. And the Germans actually replaced marks three times. Everything I read, they say only once, but that's not true. So when the mark became worthless and you had to carry a wheelbarrow worth of marks, they would give you, for all 10 marks, a new one. They did it three times. The last time they limited it to only 10,000 old marks. And so they kind of cheated us. But that can happen to us. And when Congress spends two billion, two trillion, $20 trillion, it causes inflation. You know, I go to the store to buy a nut for my farm equipment, and it's five bucks that I used to pay maybe 60 cents, you know, 20 years ago. I, I think your sons have heard this story before. Uh, he I'm cannot, he has now. to listen again. <laughs> Not again, again. I'm in charge now. Okay, okay you're in charge. But let me have the, just the mic for a little bit. So, so you had this good deal going where you would take the coffee that you guys didn't drink, you would trade it on the black market you, uh, with the Germans uh, because they wanted it, right. and then you got this nice suit that, that's up there, seersucker, I heard. And uh, what happened after the Marshall Plan came into effect? Was your care packages and your little black market activities, was it as lucrative? We, we didn't do much of it. It's just the coffee and the cigarettes, okay? There was one pack of cigarettes, not a carton, just one pack in each care packages. <laughs> the Marshall Plan did not affect me or my family or the refugees in Germany because we were taken care of by UNRWA. Everybody knew that UNRWA, that United Nations Refugee Organization, was really financed by America. And so we were not fooled. And we didn't think that we had a right to demand that America bring us here. We thought it was a privilege. We were thankful. It was a blessing that Congress finally passed a law and allowed a quarter of a million of refugees at the time that I came here in 49. We docked in the Boston on August 14, 1949 etc. So average person, the only way that, that the Germans were affected, they did develop a trust in their money because it became valuable, etc. That was, was that less than 25 words? No. But we're gonna, we're gonna give you a go on your economics lesson for tonight. So it's will or morale and trust in the 
You add the in, morale to it. Yeah, yeah, the morale. Okay, <laughs> so we've got that. Ben, for your next book. Okay. Next book. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna finish up this round of questions, and then we'll go into the the Q and A. So uh, Dorothea, you had mentioned that uh, you guys also had a little bit of black market activity. Uh, you had you had some care packages from the states. Oh yeah, my mom had gone to the pastor of the church to get a dress because my sister was supposed to get confirmed. And in the dress, there was a note from a family in Hamburg, Minnesota. They sent a, a small note saying that whoever gets the package, let them know who we are and where we live. So we sent back to these people and they decided that they wanted us to come over here to this country. Uh, at the time when they sent us care packages. After that, they sent us care packages with peanut butter, cocoa, uh, coffee, which my mom took to the black market and traded in for food for us. Also, one thing that nobody mentioned here is the fact that all of us, none of us had clothes or shoes. Uh, we all walked around Germany with shoes that had wooden soles on them. When the soles wore out, we went to a furniture maker or someone that carved a pair of soles and put them, attached them to the uppers of the shoes. So now all the Germans, I think, have flat feet. I don't know, I don't know about the rest of you, but we all walked around like that. Uh, as far as uh, getting stuff from the black market. We kids were sent out to scavenge, scavenge the streets, the sidewalks, to find cigarette butts. We'd find the cigarette butts, we'd bring them home. Mom would unwrap them, take the tobacco, put them in a little tin. She'd have a tin big enough, she'd take it to the black market and get us food. It was just everything involved around food. It was. It was just to go ahead and keep us going. Very much so. Evie, at, uh, at this point, how did the, the Marshall Plan affect your family and you? What, uh, was it a positive effect, and did, did you get into some level of normalcy for work? Yes, the Marshall Plan actually it didn't really uh, affect the German economy until 48 when the, the Daymar came out. But, and so I started my apprenticeship, and the idea was if we're gonna build up the industry in Germany, there was the intent to build up all the industries of the ravaged, war ravaged countries so they can feed themselves. The problem was, when we build up an industry, what happened to all the craftsmen? Half of them died in fighting wars all over the world. So we need young people to learn trades, to come, become carpenters, plumbers, electricians, cabinet makers, mold makers, tool and die makers, machine builders, welders, and so on. So the, 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 the government financed uh, companies to hire people and start apprenticeship programs. Three and a half year apprenticeship where the government would subsidize every company and pay, pay the wage for the apprentice. It's just a common. I just made enough money to pay the streetcar fare to and from work. But I had a job and I was learning a trade and I, I, enjoy, I took up tool and die making. So consequently, the result of it was I, I became a, a journeyman tool and die maker in 51. But there, there were no jobs that for a, a journeyman. The, the, the Marshall Plan was just starting to roll. There were not enough jobs, there were not enough factories. But in this country, we're looking for craftsmen because the boys coming home from the war to get married building homes. So I had a job waiting me here through my uncle, who was my sponsor. He had a friend at, in St. Paul. Maybe some of you heard of Remily Engineering. And the, I had a job lined up. The problem, I came here, I couldn't speak the language. And, uh, and uh, I was not used to the inch system. I was used to the, dealing with metrics, millimeters, you know. And here it is. So I had to go to night school to learn English, first of all, and, and get my high school equivalent diploma in the meantime. And then, this, uh, then I went to work, and they thought, well, what, 
we had micrometers we talked about a thousandth of an inch. I said, oh my gosh, that's awfully difficult. Then I compared it to one hundredth of a millimeter. Then I looked at my slide rule, or my, yeah, I figured it out. Hey, one thousandth of an inch is two and a half times larger than one hundredth of a millimeter. I said, no sweat. <laughs> you know, once you, once you, once you translate the dimensions, what I had a tough time with, not only learning the language, but working with, with uh, fractions, 17, 30 seconds, or 63, 64 inches, you know, I mean, you know, in the technical trade as a tool and die maker, it, you scratch your head. So I, in a way, I want to learn English, but I want to stay in the metric system. But anyway, uh, the Marshall Plans really was the precursor, I mean, that, that great incentive for Germany to build up their workforce, their, their craftsmen. And the result, as you can see, I mean, they're economically, they're, they're the machine builders. They're supplying the world with the technical, with the printing presses, car manufacturing, of course, you know, whatever else the Germans are building nowadays. Ebby, it sounds like that's a piece of cake compared to economics, or economics. Now, this is the final. I'd like you to talk exactly how your, you transpired coming to America. How, how did that opportunity occur? Paul? Uh, like I said before, after we, uh, I was in Eisenach, I tried to get over to... Uh, my, my, no, my mother had a friend in Finland. She had a little farm. She was going to get spruced up. I was supposed to come up there, help her, so that she can go get a good price for selling the farm. So in the first thing I thought, OK, Finland here, Russia here. I lived in East Germany, tried on the East German side. But <laughs> to my surprise, I got a letter. And they wanted to send me to our, that was uranium, uh, under, uh, you know, where they harvest uranium. So I thought, now it's time to leave. So this, how I left Germany, East Germany was kind of unique because uh, 10 kilometers on the border was no man's land. Only the people who live there could stay there. If you want to go in there, you had to have somebody to visit or so, you know. My mother had a, uh, right on the border living uh, her former hairdresser. So she got me the ticket. We got a ticket for, uh, going from Eisenach all the way to Frankfurt am Main. And uh, so, so and I got permission to visit these people on the border there. The unique thing was there was, uh, you know, the, the, there's all these salt mines where they, uh, the, the train came from West Germany, had to come into East Germany. The tracks were still. I mean, it was all Germany before, so they had to change the engine to the other side and pull out again. So there was a short, a short ten, five, uh, ten minutes in East Germany to hold. On the, on the other side of the train, there was a platform where the people come into the train. Nobody, it was all police. And, uh, but I, at the, another friend, we was on the other side from the train and pretended to be a railroad worker working on the tracks here. The moment the train came in, we jumped into the train and sat in the corner. We had work clothes on too, like coming from the salt mine. If we were, when they came through, they didn't attach us that we was uh, escapees. <laughs> but it didn't take very long. I mean, I had hardly any money along its offices because West Germany money was so valuable. You wouldn't risk it carrying it on yourself and get captured and get, get it taken away. What took you so much to get it together? So a little while later, a conductor came through the train and he said, ticket please. And I was proud, I showed him my ticket, you know, because my mother got the ticket. But you need an international, an interzone, you know. You need a special permit to go to West Germany, which I didn't have. He said, sorry, I'm sorry, but you have to get off. 
next train stop because we are poor. We, ca we can't afford to have any freeloaders here. So I paid for the, the rest of the money. I paid as far as I can go. And then I got out the train and started marching in the, in the, in the, to Frankfurt am Main. And uh, you, you know, you, you, and when you live in East Germany, you always under the it's a it's the same as a bad government. You know, you always feel watched, or what you're really a shy person. So I was not. But then on the end, I said I have to do something. I start hitchhiking, which <laughs> was very hard for me. So a truck stopped and took me in the, and we drove in in the direction of Frankfurt. Then when I came to, uh, on the way to Frankfurt, he said, I'll let you out here because I have to make a delivery here. And I said, no, no, I don't go no places. <laughs> I stay with you, no matter how long it takes. But the ironic thing was here in Hanau, there was this end, uh, was the end. It's just a, a suburb of Frankfurt in the east. And I had people waiting for me in the west. So it was a long way going to the big city of Frankfurt. So when I uh, approached somebody, I said, how do I get to Höchst, you know? <laughs> he said, you can't walk there, you have to take, take the streetcar. But then he looked at me, he said, you probably don't have any money, and he gave me some money. And I uh, make the uh, fast, uh, uh, story fast. Uh, I worked for maybe three months in Frankfurt to get my visa for Finland so that I can go to Finland. And uh, went to Finland, stayed there for three years. They then said, uh, how long you are on a student visa up here in Finland? So I came back, finished my schooling, and uh, then when I had my, uh, finished my uh, um, degree in agriculture, I said, what are you going to do? It was one of my saddest days, actually, in life, because I know in West Germany, having a farm or something is very hard to get, because the farmland was always in, the, in East Germany. So I thought I might try America, you know. That's how I came in America. I, I had, there was a special from the Lutheran Welfare, a special program to the one fest that took only a year and a half to wait. And I worked in a coal mine because there was good pay so that I had some money. That's how I came to America. And Paul, that was in 1955 and you went to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Correct. Yeah. Okay, Dorothea, can you tell us how uh, you came to America? Well, we were sponsored by the family in Hamburg that had sent uh, the clo the care package. Uh, it was my my dad came home from uh, Czechoslovakia in 1948. So in 49, we came here. We came here three days three days before Christmas. Took the train from New York to Hamburg, Minnesota. Uh, my dad was very disappointed that when he came here, it was under false pretenses. Uh, the family that sponsored all of us, the seven of us, had decided that they were going to go ahead and make money off of us instead of helping us. The whole, the whole town of Hamburg knew exactly what was happening and they tried to forewarn us and tell us not to come, but all the wheels had been set in motion and when we got here, the, the town people rallied around my dad and said, you have got to become independent of this person that sponsored you, and we will help you out. They gave my dad the money to build. My dad was a furniture and cabinet maker, and they gave my dad the money to build a house, to build a shop, uh, to come, become independent. After 30 years in this country, my when my dad passed away, he had a house, a cabinet shop, a cabin, everything paid for, money in the bank. And one thing I want to say, any of you World War II veterans out here, I cannot, and I say it again, I cannot thank you enough for what you did for all of us here on the panel. 
<laughs> when you came over and you fought for us. Thank you very much. And uh, is there anybody with you here tonight? Yes, my husband Jim, who's been on this panel before. <laughs> hey, he's smiling. He's smiling. <laughs> Len, please tell us about how you came to America and who's with you here tonight. My mother had friends, like I said, east of Hinckley and Sandstone. So in 46, he remembered, she only remembered the name of township, Sand Creek Township, which is east of Sandstone. So she sent a, a letter that we survived the war. She would never ask anybody for anything. And they got excited. And the 8th District Congressman was very influential in passing the law for 250,000 refugees to come from Germany. And they sponsored, these farmers who are not the richest ones here in Minnesota sponsored 25 families, 125 people. They had to guarantee the total welfare to the government. And of course, we all wanted to work. I didn't say it before. The, the worst thing that happened to males, like my dad and other men adults, they couldn't, there was no work for us to do. I mean, I was in school because I was a child. But my father had nothing to do for four years. So this was a great relief to come and work, uh, find work here, and be productive and contributor. And, and who is this right here? <clears throat> I had a dream when I was a nine-year-old kid in the refugee camp to be a Polish warrior, Hussar. <clears throat> and I had to settle to be a naval aviator, like I showed the picture over there. <laughs> and Dave Landine, of course, and I were uh, like about the same yeah. time, etc. <laughs> so that was a, quite a compromise, but I thought you might want to see what a Polish hussar was. This was the mightiest cavalry. <laughs> a King John Sobieski, there's a town of Sobieski, east, northeast of uh, Little Falls. With 5,000 of these guys, he wiped out 100,000 Turks. 200,000. Well, later on, he wiped out the same number in Vienna. But at first, it was southwestern Ukraine. And they never invaded Europe since 1683, September 12, 1683, until last year, when Germans allowed Muslims to come into their country. <laughs> okay, uh, thank, thanks, Len. We, we got more than we bargained for tonight. Now, Abby, uh, you've told us a little bit about how you came to the States. Tell us about the award that you have here. Yes. Well, as a youngster living in the war zone, again, talking about daily bombings, I thought there's more to life than being a victim, being a, uh, uh, yeah, being a, what do we call it? Uh, Damage? No, what we call it? Uh, post traumatic? Post, no, no. No, uh, what do you call that word damage? When you, incidental war damage, what, what do you call Collateral. it? Collateral. Collateral damage, right. So I thought, I got, after the war's over, I'm going to look for the promised land. And I came to this country and I decided to be an American by choice. And I'm still here. I got stuck here. I, I, I didn't search any further. And thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you. <laughs> thank you. Let's give the panel a round of applause. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn dash www.roundtable.org Production services provided by Barrows Productions.